Hi friends, Simit here from InformedTrades.com. In today's video, we're going to talk about the return on invested capital metric, what that is, and how investors and traders can use it to find stocks that might be undervalued. Let's get started. Okay, key points. We'll start by defining return on invested capital, ROIC. We'll take a look at the pros and cons, some applications, how other in traders and investors are using it. We'll look at some sample back-tested results, and finally, we'll conclude with a usage with a screener, how we can apply the information we've covered in this video to, uh, to identify stocks that may possibly be undervalued in light of the ROIC metric. <clears throat> okay, so first up, what is ROIC? I should note that there's a number of ways to calculate this. It's a non-standard financial metric, which is, that's going to introduce some confusion and, and potential, uh, you know, personally, I'm not a huge fan of this metric, and one of the reasons why I don't like it is just it's very ambiguous in calculating it, so depending on what screener you're using, there's going to be issues there. Um, some people like it for that reason. They, they feel like, you know, it's one of those indicators that's not just given to you, so if you, it can be an edge. Uh, a lot of uh, investors and traders aren't using it. But the basic idea is it's similar in a way to return on equity or price book. Or, no, it's more like return on equity, I should say, excuse me, or return on assets, where you're trying to measure income relative to the assets that you have. Now, actually, the actual formula is earnings before in interest and in taxes minus adjusted taxes divided by the book value of the debt plus the book value of the equity minus the cash that you have. So what are we getting at here? Basically, the, so the numerator is largely earnings focused. It's how much we're measuring income earnings relative to something. <coughs> Excuse me. The denominator is <clears throat> debt plus equity minus cash. So these are this is capital that the company has that it's deployed towards earning towards uh, developing earnings. So it's you know the numerator is earnings. The denominator is what have we purchased, whether it's you know property, plant, equipment. Uh, inventory that we have, uh, how much money have we raised, have we borrowed as you know, liabilities that we ultimately owe. All of that that is being put towards production, put towards generating earnings, uh, and then sort of measuring the two. So when this number is high, it suggests that a company is very efficient in generating earnings, meaning you give it some assets and it can generate quite a bit of income off it. This number is usually reported as a percentage. So it's very similar. We're trying to do the same thing with return on equity. Uh, one difference is that here we're measure, we're taking out cash, right? Because cash is not really invested capital. So cash is just, you know, it's money you have, but you're not actually using it uh, to generate income. It's just sitting in the bank. So some might regard this as a more refined uh, measure than return on equity, which doesn't really filter out cash. That's sort of the, the basic idea is that, you know, here is the assets that we're deploying. Now, how efficient are they in generating income? Applications and key considerations. So, you know, the applications that were presented here, this is the formula that Guru screener, GuruFocus.com uses in their screener, excuse me. And that's sort of the main screener that I use. Others, however, will use a different metric. So, there, some will look at um, not earnings, but non-operating income, which is even more refined. You know, you're, you're factoring out uh, income that is not coming from operations. So, if it's income that's coming from some investment, you're filtering that out. So, the Guru Focus doesn't apply that. Uh, you know, it's looking at earnings. It is it is factoring in non-operating income. But the point is that these calculations aren't 100% standardized. So, when you're, that's something to bear in mind when you're looking at back testing when you're looking at what screener you want to use, do you really understand the formula and is it what you expect it to be? So calculations may vary. 10% uh, is a rule of thumb, meaning if a company is generating 10% return on invested capital, that's pretty interesting. Uh, you may want to start there. You know, you can move it up 15%, 20%, etc. Okay, and lastly, there's the point of whether or not this indicator is mean reverting. Um, and there's two ways of looking at this, and that's what the charts on the screen now are, back, are about. When an indicator is mean reverting, that means it's going to go back to its average. So if a stock has a high return on invested capital, that means it may be time to sell it or at least operate with the expectation that return on invested capital is going to go back down. Conversely, if it's low, that may be a time that it's time to buy, that you know the industry is undervalued as a whole, that returns uh, will, will be coming back in. 
So that's sort of the principle behind uh, mean reversion in RLIC, or is that applicable? From that perspective, if it is applicable, you may not want to buy a stock with a high RLIC. If it's not applicable, you may want to. Meaning, if it's not applicable, you're thinking the stock's really efficient. If it is, if you think it's mean reverting, you're saying, oh, it's performing too well, maybe it's going to come back down. <coughs> Excuse me. So there's two charts on the screen that sort of discuss that a bit. This top one here, we're looking at a portfolio from 1997 to 2006, and it's broken up by quintile. So this top blue one is the top 20% of stocks um, that, are, that have the highest ROIC. This yellow line here is the lowest 20% of uh, ROIC stocks. Um, and we can see that in nine years, they all sort of gravitate towards the mean right around here, which is they're approaching or closing in on the weighted average cost of capital of 8%. Weighted average cost of capital is a little beyond the scope of this video, but basic idea is how much did it cost the company to raise all the equity and debt um, uh, capital that it needed. Uh, so the idea here is that uh, ROIC reverts to the weighted average cost of capital, which in this case is 8%. <clears throat> However... If you break down the quintiles uh, even further, meaning if you break down each quintile into five other quintiles, we notice that, for instance here, the first quintile, this blue line here, if you take the first quintile of that quintile, so the top 20% of these stocks, which is basically like the top 4 or 5%, they're still in the top uh, quintile over here. So there is persistence in the top quintile of a there's a, basically, there's the high stocks, the really s select amount of stocks do continue to outperform. So while the first quintile as a whole declined, uh, the, the best performing quintile of that subset, of that first quintile, uh, actually continued to be in the top. So they managed to retain their position. So maybe the implication here is that if you focus on the best of the best, then you can see that RLIC is persistent. Um, so personally, I, you know, I'm I just find there's too many causes for skepticism with this metric. I'm not convinced by it, but uh, you know, these are all points to consider. Okay, now looking at this in the context of a sample backtest, <clears throat> this is from OldSchoolValue.com. They've done a number of great backtests. We feature their uh, their backtests in a, some of our other videos. Um, here's a three-year period where the portfolio is rebalanced every six months. So every six months they're selling their stocks and buying new stocks or at least reevaluating whether they should hold it. The screen here is for return on capital above 10% for each of the past three years. So it starts in 2004. That means it's been, it was above 10% in 2003, 2002, and 2001. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and if so, so that might be, depending on what screener you use, you may find difficulty uh, finding that metric. There's a screener on oldschoolvalue.com that might be relevant for this. <clears throat> now, here we see this uh, blue line, the orange line here is the S&P 500. Um, so that appreciated 26%. ROIC did outperform that. It's the green line here, appreciated 54%. They also plotted on here CROIC, which is cash return on invested capital, which is basically free cash flow over invested capital. Uh, so whereas we've been talking about ROIC is earnings over invested capital, free cash, uh, CRO size, CROIC is free cash flow over invested capital. If you look back in our video on free cash flow, that sort of describes that a little bit more. It's a little bit more refined measure. This one, that measure, CROIC is even more obscure. So ROIC is not really conventional, but CROIC is even more so in that category. <clears throat> but here, from 2004 to 2007, we do see that ROIC and even CROIC uh, outperformed the S&P 500, especially uh, ROIC. Now, from 2007 to 2010, <clears throat> we see that ROIC underperforms the S&P 500, and CROIC slightly outperforms. So, and this is the same criteria where you're looking for stocks that have 10% uh, or more, for each of the past three years. Uh, there's also some other parameters, mainly that there's 20,000 stocks. <clears throat> Average daily trading volume is at least 20,000. And you're looking at a portfolio of 15 stocks, the top 15 stocks that meet these criteria. So, and this, all of this doesn't factor in um, transaction costs. So that's also something pretty significant to consider. So, you know, there are some mixed results here. <clears throat> 
you know, that adds to my skepticism of the uh, indicator, but intuitively it makes a lot of sense, and perhaps if you combine it with some other metrics, it may be, uh, it may be of interest. Okay, if you do like it and you do want to apply it to a screener, gurufocus.com has this included as one of its many metrics. You can sort of add here simply, you know, what do I want to look at? Do I want to look at top 10, top 20, you know, etc. You can filter also, you know, just show me the top 500 stocks with ROIC. Here I've set it to the top, but any stock with the ROIC of greater than 10%, you know, you can start filtering from there. You can say let's exclude OTC stocks. <clears throat> Filter by industry, uh, et cetera, revenue, market cap. Let's say we want to have uh, at least a market cap of a billion. Okay, so now we might have something to work with, a thousand stocks here. Um, we can also add an evaluation rank. Like we talked about, this is measuring income relative to assets. So it's, it's an income related measurement. We might also want to find stocks, we also might want to add in a price related measurement. So find stocks that are cheap and generate income. So let's say price book to ratio that is in the lowest 20th percent. So here we have stocks that are, uh, here we have stocks with a low price to book ratio um, and that meet the criteria put forward, you know, market cap of at least a billion, return on, equity, uh, return on invested capital 10 percent, 57 stocks here. This might be an interesting sort of way to filter where we know the stocks are cheap based on their price to book ratio and we know that they're reasonably efficient in generating earnings based on their ROIC might be something to uh, as a way a sample usage of how this filter could be applied and that's about it any questions you have anything you want to add on return on invested capital join us at informedtrades.com best of luck in your trading and investing and we'll see you next time take care